the family of the age of space. But they are folks like you and me. They just live in a faster pace. George Jetson is the family head. Jane is his faithful wife. With daughter Judy and Delroy, they lead a hectic life. The Jetsons fly in a rocket ship. They spend weekends on Mars. They make interplanetary trips in flying saucer cars. A futuristic life they lead with ultra-modern ways. But what the Jetsons wouldn't give for the good old days. The Jetsons fly in a rocket ship. They spend weekends on Mars. They make interplanetary trips in flying saucer cars. A futuristic life they lead with ultra-modern ways. But what the Jetsons wouldn't give for the good old days. Futura at the ultra-modern Spaceways Apartments, the Jetson family, Jane Jetson, her teenage daughter Judy, her small son Elroy, and the family pooch Astro are waiting for the head of the family, George Jetson, to return from a hard day's work pushing buttons at the Spacely Sprocket Factory. Gee, Mom, I wish Pop would get home from work. I want to tell him the big news. Me too, Mom. Isn't it exciting? Well, it will be the first time a whole family flew to the moon. Mom, Judy, look. Here comes Pop now. Good old Pop. He's always in such a hurry to get home to his dear little family that he breaks the sound barrier. Yes, but I wish he'd stop making those sonic booms. It breaks every window in the house. Hi, Jane. Hi, Judy. Hi, Elroy. Hi, Astro. Elroy. Down, boy. Down. Down, Astro. Down, I say. Jane, get this monster off of me. Oh, George, Astro was only trying to be friendly. But a dog that big could friendly a guy into the hospital. Hey, Pop, did you hear the big news? Yes, Elroy, the Dodgers finally won a game. No, I mean about the moon. The moon? What about the moon? Oh, it was on the radio and television all day. Somebody's going to the moon. So what's so exciting about some astronaut going to the moon? That's nothing new. But, Pop, my poor, hard-working father, don't you keep up with the news? The boss, Mr. Spacely, won't let us watch TV during working hours. I might push the wrong button. They said on TV that some lucky family was going to win a trip to the moon. Free! Isn't that wonderful, George? An all-expense-paid free trip to the moon. But why? What for? Who needs a trip to the moon? I haven't even seen Niagara Falls yet. I believe in seeing America first. I'll turn on the TV to the Government Information Channel and see if they're ready to announce the lucky winner. What's the government got to do with a trip to the moon? And now, ladies and gentlemen of America, it's time for the big announcement you've all been waiting for. As you know, if you watch our daily program, Information USA, the government has decided to sponsor a free trip to the moon. The purpose of this moon trip is to find out if an average, ordinary, typical American family like yours can live on the moon. To date, only highly trained astronauts have dared venture to the moon. But sooner or later, we must find out if an average family can survive on the moon. As you know, we've asked all volunteers to send in their names, the number in their family, the kind of house they live in, and other information. We received thousands of volunteers, but the family chosen will be America's most typical family. And now, for the exciting announcement. We are taking all the information sent to us, feeding it into our electronic brain, and when I press this switch, the computer will come up with the name of the winning family. Stand by. Gee, Pop, isn't this crazy? You don't know how crazy it is, Elroy. Anybody that would take that trip to the moon has got to be crazy. Shh, look. There goes the electronic computer. <laughs> He's got the winner in his hand. I wonder who it'll be. Well, it can't be me, because I didn't enter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest moment in the history of America is at hand. 
We have here the name of the lucky family that will make the trip to the moon. Hold your breath. Here it is. The winner is the most typical family in America. A husband, 38, his wife, 35, a daughter, 16, and a cute little boy, seven years of age. Oh, yes, and one dog. George, that's the size of our family. Yeah, but it can't be us because we didn't enter. I'm too smart for that. And now, the name of the winning family, America's first family on the moon, the family of George Jetson. I gotta have my ears checked. Sounded like he said George Jetson. <laughs> George Jetson? Jane, that's me and uh, us. Wow, Bob, we won, we won. What do you mean, we won? We didn't even enter the contest. I've been meaning to talk to you about that, Pop. About what, Elroy? Uh, well, I cannot tell a fib. I entered our name in the contest. Elroy, why? Well, you know, I just thought it might be kind of fun to go to the moon. Well, we're not going, and that's that. Oh, it would be wonderful, George. We feel like Columbus when he discovered America. Have you lost your mind, Jane? It's dangerous, and it's ridiculous. I'll call the government up and explain it's all a horrible mistake. I'm not going to the moon. Mr. Spacely would fire me. It's probably the government man now. George Jetson. Oh, hiya, Mr. Spacely. Oh, I'm proud of you, George. All of us here at Spacely Sprockets are proud to know a man so brave, so completely fearless, going to the moon. How about that? But, Mr. Spacely, I, I can't go to the moon. I, I got work to do. Nonsense, George, nonsense. <laughs> we'll get somebody else to do your work for you. You just go to the moon and don't worry about a thing. But, boss, I'm not going. I, I wouldn't want to risk my family on a trip to the moon. George, those rockets are as safe as the freeways. Safer? But I'm not going, and that is final. What do you mean you're not going? We've already bought you a going away present, and there's a big write-up coming out in the morning paper. All about the hero from Spacely's Sprocket Company. Oh, that publicity is worth millions. And you're not going to check it out. And by the way, George, uh, there'll be a $5 a week raise for you if you get back. Bye. If I get back? Oh, boy. Dad, wake up! Look, the headline's in the morning paper with a picture of the whole Jetson family. What's the idea of waking me up at five in the morning, Elroy? Dad, listen to what it says in the paper. George Jetson, employee of Spacely Sprockets, was selected as the winner of the big free trip to the moon contest. George, his wife Jane, a teenage daughter Judy, and their small son Elroy were selected because they are a typical American family. Arrangements are being made at Cape Kennedy, and the big moon rocket, Moonbeam 1, is scheduled to blast off for the moon tomorrow. How about that, Pop? We're going to be astronauts. You mean astronauts? We got no business flying to the moon. I can't stand high altitudes. Now, George, nowadays rocket travel is as safe as the freeways. I know. That's what scares me. But there's no backing out now. We've already agreed to go, so let's pack up a few things and get ready. There's over 200 million Americans, and I gotta be the one that they shoot to the moon. Oh, boy. We flipped our lids, we walk on men. We act like kids, it's really sad. Cause the moon today is the latest fan. We got moon fever, and got it bad. Got moon fever and a 
Ice Pop riding in a real jet helicopter? Frankly, I would have been happier taking the subway. High altitudes make my ears pop. Oh, George, if you can't stand a helicopter, how are you going to stand being up 250,000 miles when we go to the moon? Quit talking like that, Jane. You might scare the children. Oh, don't worry about us, Dad. Goody and I aren't scared of anything, are we? Hey, look, we're already coming into Cape Kennedy. Isn't this exciting, George? There's a big crowd of photographers and newsmen down there. And television cameras. Wow! I always wanted to be a television star. The couple very home. Look, George, a welcoming committee. All the top brass. Wow. Look, Judy, what a keen rocket. Moonbeam one. Just like Commander Cosmic on TV uses. Mr. Jetson? Yes, sir. I am Colonel Culpepper of the National Aviation and Space Administration. Pleased to meet you, Colonel. Uh, this is my wife, Jane, daughter, Judy, and son, Elroy. Jetson, I am so proud to know a man like you. Brave. Brave? Fearless. Fearless? It's like shaking hands with Columbus just as he set sail for the new world. Now tell me, Columbus, I mean, Jetson, are there any questions you would like to ask before you blast off? Yes, Colonel. Who do I see about calling this trip off? Calling the moon flight off? By George Jetson, you are not only brave, but you got a mighty keen sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, George is a barrel of laughs. <laughs> you know, Colonel, that's a long ride to the moon. You really think it's safe? Safe? Why, Jetson, my boy, rocket travel today is as safe as driving on the freeways. That's the problem. Now, Jetson, if you and your lovely family will step over here to the portable dressing room, we're going to get you into your spacesuits. Boy, spacesuits, just like Commander Cosmic on TV. Well, George, how do I look? Not bad, Jane. How do I look? Like Commander Cosmic on TV. <laughs> now, folks, uh, before you get into the rocket, I would like to ask you to step over here and say a few words to your public. I say your public. Our public? Of course. The eyes of the whole world are on this launch pad today, my boy. You are about to go down in history. I wish you wouldn't use that expression, go down. Oh, I'm sorry, son. I say sorry about that. Uh, let's just step over here to the microphone. And now, ladies and gentlemen of TV land, this is your favorite newscaster, Conway Dinwiddie, bringing you an historic event. In just a few minutes, this lovely family, George Jetson, his wife Jane, daughter Judy, and son Elroy, will blast off this very launch pad in the rocket Moonbeam One, Destination Moon. Selected as the most typical of American families, the Jetsons were given the honor of being the first family on the moon. Mrs. Jetson. Would you like to say a few words to the folks out in TV land? I'm so proud. I could cry. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Jetson. And now, Judy, would you like to say a few words? I'm so happy. I could cry. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. And now, how about you, Elroy? Me? I'm so excited. I could cry. <laughs> and now, Mr. Jetson... How about you? Me? I'm so scared I could cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, the time has come. I say the time has come. If you'll just step into the rocket here, you'll be strapped into position in your capsule. <laughs> Bird, Moonbeam One is ready. The gantries have been removed. I believe all systems are go. And in the blockhouse, they are ready to start the final countdown. The count is picked up at zero minus ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, fire. <laughs> There she goes, ladies and gentlemen, a beautiful liftoff. The Moonbeam One's five million pound thrust lifted her straight up. She's climbing nicely. The first stage booster has just burned out and is separating from the Moonbeam One. 
They've reached escape velocity and are heading into the ionosphere. It looks like a perfect shot. Who started all this race for space? This yen to fly to Mars. Why has the whole world joined the race to Venus and the stars? Why should mankind want to fly to Jupiter so far? But I like to know is why don't we stay where we are? If man is looking for the way to happiness afar, he never learned this very thing to live back where we are. Oh, and I'd like to take a trip and through the heavens drone. I'd like to fly a rocket ship, but not too far from home. It's always dark out in space. I don't care what people think. I'm going to tell the pilot of this thing to take us back home. Where is the pilot, Dad? I'll go find him. Boy, wait till I tell the kids at school about flying to the moon. Jane, something's wrong. What's the matter, George? You look like you saw a ghost. I can't find the pilot. I've looked in every compartment from the nose cone to the engine room. Where's the pilot? Why don't you radio Cape Kennedy, Dad? And ask Colonel Culpepper. Good idea, Elroy. I'll do it. George Jetson in the Moonbeam 1, calling Cape Kennedy. Come in, Cape Kennedy. Come in, anybody. This is Colonel Culpepper at Cape Kennedy. I say, come in, Moonbeam 1. Colonel, I'd like to ask you a question. Go right ahead, son. I say, go right ahead. How you gonna learn if you don't ask questions? Colonel, we haven't got a pilot in this rocket ship. Now simmer down, son. Sure you got a pilot. But we haven't. I looked all over this rocket. There's no pilot. Now, son, relax. I say relax. You have got a pilot. Where is he? Why, he is right here at the controls. At the controls? What controls? Why, the rocket controls right here at Cape Kennedy. At Cape Kennedy? I mean, Cape Kennedy? That's right, son. I say right. The Moonbeam 1 is an automatic pilot. We are handling the controls by radio from here at Cape Kennedy. Uh-oh, our pilot is way down there, and we're way up here. Oh, boy. George Jetson in the Moonbeam 1 calling Cape Kennedy. Come in, Cape Kennedy. You called, son? Yes, Colonel. I I'm worried. Are you sure this remote control idea will work? Well, uh, it might. It might? Aren't you positive? Not exactly. You see, son, we never tried it before. But, but don't worry. I say, don't worry. I hardly ever make a mistake. Hardly ever? Oh, boy. Jensen, what is your position right now? My position? Well, if you must know, I'm kneeling. Good boy. I say, good boy. A little praying never hurt nobody. So long, son, and uh, keep in touch now, you hear? Jane, look at this gauge or speedometer, whatever it is. Do you see that? Sure, George. It says 10,000 miles per hour. Why? Why? That's too fast. I'll radio Cape Kennedy. George Jetson in the Moonbeam 1, calling Cape Kennedy. Come in. This here's a colonel, son. Uh, what's your problem? You gotta slow this thing down. 
we're going over 10,000 miles an hour, we could get arrested. Quit fretting, son. I say quit fretting. We was just getting ready to slow you down anyhow. You were? Good. I I'm not much at speeding, you know. We're ready to reverse your rocket so we can turn the moonbeam around. Turn it around? Great. Then we're coming home. Uh, not exactly, boy. Uh, you see, we got to turn the rocket around so as we can land you on the moon. Any questions? Yes. Couldn't we just call this whole thing off? I don't want to see the moon. I've seen it. Stand by, son. I can't talk now. Uh, we got work to do. We wouldn't want that rocket to crash. You wouldn't? Pop, Mom, look how big the moon is. It's bigger than the Earth. Not really, Elroy. It just looks bigger because we're closer to it. Stand by, folks. Slip into your spacesuits, strap yourself into your seats, fasten your seat belts, because we are going to set you down on the moon. Pop, look! It's a desert. Those mountains, they must be miles high. Oh, Mother, isn't the Earth beautiful tonight? Yeah. Already, I'm homesick. Hey, look, Pop. I'm bouncing around like I'm a trampoline. Ooh, I feel light as a feather. I feel light in the head. This is wonderful. I feel like I've lost 25 pounds. Do I look any slimmer, George? No, but I've read somewhere the gravity on the moon is only one-sixth that of the Earth. Elroy, where are you going? Gee, Pop, I just want to have a look around. Well, we got to stick close together. No telling what we might find on the moon, or what might find us. Wild animals, monsters, moon people, anything. And I wouldn't want any of you to be frightened. That's my George, always thinking of the other fellow. <laughs> Jane, Judy, Alroy, quick! Back in the rocket ship! Why, George? What's the matter? Don't just stand there, Jane. All of you, head for the rocket on the double. But, George, why? Why? Look down there, on, on the ground. I don't see anything, George. Can't you see that footprint? That's the biggest footprint I ever saw. It must be some kind of horrible monster. Oh, George, that's your own footprint. You've been walking in circles. It is? <laughs> well, so it is. I, I knew it was some kind of footprint. Hey, Pop, it must be late. It's getting awful dark. We're going into the dark side of the moon. Yeah, I can't see a thing now. Wait, I'll strike a match. Hmm. The matches won't strike. They're not wet. Oh, George, you know you can't strike matches here. There's no oxygen on the moon. Yeah, it slipped my mind. Mother! Dad, what's happening? It's a meteor shower. Quick, everybody into the rocket ship. Everybody, follow me. Boy, it's raining rocks. We haven't got much farther to go. Hurry! Quick, into the rocket. Lock the hatch. We gotta get out of here. Aye, aye, Captain. Hatch secured. We'd better radio the control center at Cape Kennedy. Right, Judy. Captain Jetson, I mean, George Jetson on the Moonbeam 1, calling control center at Cape Kennedy. Come in, Cape Kennedy. Come in. They don't answer. Maybe we ought to phone them. You know, long distance. Keep trying, George. We've got to get out of here. If one of those meteors hits this rocket, we'll be marooned on the moon. George Jetson on the moon rocket Moonbeam 1, calling control center at Cape Kennedy. Come in, Cape Kennedy. Come in. Dad, you forgot to turn the radio switch on. The radio switch? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, yeah, the radio switch. There. George Jetson on the Moonbeam 1, calling Cape Kennedy. Come in, Cape Kennedy. This here is Colonel Culpepper, calling Moonbeam 1. Do you read me, son? Colonel, you gotta get us off the moon quick. Get you off the moon? Y you just got there. Don't you like being on the moon? Oh, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here. But, Jetson, you're supposed to stay there long enough to find out if an average family can survive on the moon. I found out already. The answer is no. Negative. Why not, boy? I haven't got time to go into that now. There's a meteor shower going on. How's that, son? I say, there's a meteor shower going on. Speak up, son. I say, speak up. I can't hear you on account of that meteor shower going on. Tell our pilot at Control Center to start pushing buttons. we got to get off the moon before the rocket is destroyed by meteors. Okay, boy. Don't go away. Don't go away? Stand by for blast off. Jetson, boy, what was that? We just got hit by a big meteor. Any 
anybody hurt? No, but the rocket ship is damaged. Stand by. We'll try to lift you off. <laughs> What's the matter, boy? I say, what is the matter? Something's wrong. We're pushing the right buttons. But we can't get that thing off the ground. I think I see the trouble, Colonel. Uh, there's a part of the automatic controls broken off. I, I guess the meteor jarred it loose. Detson. Detson, boy. You gotta be brave now. I say brave. I don't know how to tell you this, but... Uh... Don't tell me. I couldn't stand the bad news. What's wrong, Pop? Why can't we blast off? How can we? This rocket is operated by remote controls from Cape Kennedy, by radio signals. But with this thing broken, they can't control the rocket. Boy, I wonder what Commander Cosmic would do in a case like this. I told you we should have stayed home. Oh, quit worrying, George. Everything will turn out all right. Women, they think all you gotta do is say that everything will turn out all right, and it will. Control Center at Cape Kennedy calling Moonbeam 1. Come in, Jetson. Jetson here. Jetson, I say Jetson. We think we got a way to get you back to Earth. You have? Hear that, Jane? They're gonna get us home. How, Colonel? Well, uh, it may not work, but uh, we can try. Colonel, I'll try anything. You name it. Well, uh, are the manual controls still okay? Uh, yes, Colonel. They look okay. Why? Well, we're gonna try something. We're gonna radio you instructions. Now, you do exactly what we tell you, and you may make it back to Earth. You mean, you want me to fly this thing? Right. But, Colonel... I flunked my driver's license test three times. I can't fly a rocket. How do you know, boy? I say, how do you know? Till you tried. Now stand by. Pay attention, boy. Oh, boy. George Jitson, an astronaut. Wow. Pop's gonna be a spaceman. Wait till the kids at school hear about this. What'll I do, Jane? Do exactly as the Colonel says. What else can we do? Okay. George Jetson, standing by, sir. What are your instructions? All right, Jetson. You got the whole control panel right in front of you. All the controls are marked. So here's what you do. First, flip on the hydraulic booster fuel injection switch. Turn the electronic digital computer valve clockwise. Switch on the automated orbital rectifier gauge. Aye, aye, sir. Then what? Now throw it in the gear. Push in the clutch. Let the brake off. Release the clutch, and away you go! Stand by, everybody, and fasten your seatbelts. We're blasting off! Boy, Dad sure is a keen astronaut. He handles a rocket ship just like Commander Cosmic. Nothing to it, Elroy, once you learn the gear shift. <laughs> Gee, Pop, can I be your co-pilot? Sure, Elroy. I'll go check the fuel gauges in the back. I never noticed that door before. I wonder what's in there. I'll just open it and see. <laughs> Nothing but a little bitty old room. Hey, there's another door. I'll just open it and... Uh-oh, I'm outside. Help! Okay, Elroy. Want to handle the controls? Elroy. Hey, Elroy. Where's Elroy? Elroy? He's got to be in the rocket someplace. Mother, look! What is it, Judy? It's Elroy, floating along outside the rocket. Elroy! George! Elroy's outside the rocket. Well, tell him to get back in here before he catches cold. Outside? Elroy! George, what are we going to do? You take over the controls, Jane. Just keep the course we're on. I'll grab a tether and try to pull Elroy back in. Poor Elroy, he's floating in space. Elroy! Where are you, Elroy? Oh, there you are, in back of the rocket. You switch on your radio, Elroy. Okay, Dad, it's on. Don't move around any more than you have to. I'll jet myself over to you. Easy now. Steady, boy. Steady. I made it. Mother, Dad's got Elroy. See if you can help pull them back in. And be careful, Judy. Okay, Mom. <laughs> than any real spaceman wouldn't have done. <laughs> George, look, we're not far from the Earth. Home, sweet home. I'll take over now. Cape Kennedy calling rocket ship Moonbeam 1. Come in, Jetson. Jetson here. We are ready to start reversing the rocket and try for a landing. Try? Oh, boy. Now, don't be nervous, son. I say do not be nervous. Just follow instructions. Ready? Ready, Colonel. 
First, you switch on the stabilizer. Well, Pop, how does it feel to be a famous astronaut? Famous astronaut? Sure, Pop. Listen to this story in the newspaper. Today, George Jetson, employee of Spacely Sprockets, brought the rocket ship Moonbeam One safely back to Earth from a trip to the moon. How about that, Dad? Well, it does sound good, but that's the last time I'm going to the moon. Why, I wouldn't live on the moon if you gave me a million bucks. You can have the moon. I've had it. I'll get it. Oh, hello, boss. George Jetson. Oh, I'm proud of you, George. Thanks. You just go to the moon and don't worry about a thing. What? What do you mean but you're boss, not going? We've I, I can't. You a going away but present and there's a big I'd rather not. Coming out of the moon but I... Well, what was that all about, George? It was Mr. Spacely, my boss. He's opening up a new branch office and he's sending me to be the manager. Well, George, that's wonderful. Where is he opening his new office? On the moon. We pick the countdown up again. We start at 25. 15 seconds. Now it's 10. Will I get back alive? Then I hear the final word. I know I'm on my way. Zero. I'm off like a bird. Away too. They wouldn't say. I don't know why I'm out in space far from my native land. I'd rather be some other place. For instance, a bedrock land. I don't know why that they picked me for a rocket engineer. I'm sure that it is plain to see. I didn't volunteer. But here I am, an astronaut. Oh, what a sticky wicket. I wouldn't really mind it, but um, I've got a one-way ticket.